Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining today's boot camp on uh, optimizing EDR4 in Central. If you have been to any of the other EDR boot camps, it's pretty much the same uh, content. It's just going to be specific to the platform that you're using today. Uh, this is going to be for um, in Central EDR. If you're using EDR through RMM or standalone, at, still stick around. We're going to be going over the exact same things. The only difference really is, is that you know, your menus might be in a slightly different location in RMM versus in Central, but the core functionality, the function, the core functionality, the features, the policy settings, everything's the same between in Central and RMM. So we're going to start off with just a quick few set of slides before we drop into actual demonstration in product. Um, today's uh, session is, you know, we're not trying to sell you EDR at this point. We're with, under the assumption you've already decided that you're going to use EDR. You just want to figure out what's the best ways to use it. So uh, the slide decks we've got here, we're going to get through those really quickly, but they're worth mentioning because uh, going over some of these because it helps give you a better understanding and appreciation for what the difference is between legacy AV and what you may have been doing prior and what new capabilities are going to be available to you by transitioning to an EDR solution. And this chart does a really good a really good job of just laying it out as about as simple as you can. Whenever you're comparing legacy AV that you've traditionally used, like Bit Defender that's inside of in central as AV Defender or any other type of solution of that nature. Well, let's start out with the they catch something. So whenever EDR or an AV solution catches something, well, they share the kill uh, the kill of the process and quarantine any of the payload files that it can find. They share that. There's no difference in that functionality of you know detecting something, killing the process, quarantining the payload files. But that is where traditional AV solutions have stopped. Even some uh, more advanced endpoint protection platform solutions just stop at that stage. They don't go any further. Whereas with EDR, whenever you have the remediation capabilities activated, they're able to remove any additional files that were uh, downloaded to the system during a threat incident. They're able to remove any files that were created during a threat incident. And they're also able to restore the registry settings of a system back to their prior state. So whenever something happens to a system, because the way it works, it knows what happens and it can revert those for you without you having to be involved in the process. And those are things that you simply just cannot do with legacy AV. And then you also got the EDR rollback capability that allows you to roll files back to their previous version. So if a file was modified, during a threat incident, a la ransomware. EDR is able to leverage the VSS snapshots on the system to revert those files back to their previous versions. And these differences here are more than just a benefit that you get with the product. This is stuff that you can build security offerings around. You can change your entire dynamics of how your workflows work for your technicians and your client communications that you build off of it. And that's going to be a little bit of what we're going into once we get into the configuration side and some other benefits of EDR and inside of the demo. So first, with this, uh, with this chart, we're really just showing the fact that there are core functionalities that EDR has that are not available with traditional AV. You need to understand them so that you can take advantage of them. But there's also just the pure efficacy uh, part of EDR that's worth spending just the two minutes on to go over real quick because it helps set perspective on things. The next couple of slides, this is all information is pulled from an impartial third party audit of a lot of the major players in the security suite uh, business. So. If you have any familiarity with MITRE, uh, great. If not, they're a nonprofit organization that's responsible for the attack and defend uh, frameworks and a lot of other things in the industry. And they do annual uh, security assessments of security software vendors. And it's not a pay to play. 
Everybody just volunteers and they get tested against a simulated set of attacks. We did, they did Carbonac and Fin7 last year. They came out really well. And just the whole point of all of these slides is just to raise to the surface that EDR has the highest efficacy on detection rates. So whenever it comes to the knowledge that did EDR pick up something, yeah, if it picked up something, then chances are nothing else would have picked it up. So it can help reaffirm your confidence in the fact that you're detecting what is there and you can take action on what the EDR information is giving you and feel a little bit more sure of what you're doing. And every one of these slides is just showing that EDR, Sentinel-1, is on the top for every one of these metrics that we're tested against. For uh, 174 of the, tips, the steps that were tested against, it was able to detect all 174. Um, also, delayed detection. So this is even more important to realize. EDR did not have a delay in its capability of detecting a threat. A lot of these other solutions weren't able to do it in real time where EDR can. It can make the decisions on the endpoint in real time without having to rely on cloud infrastructure anywhere. And I'm gonna speed through these slides because again, we're not really here to sell you EDR today. This is about you know efficiency and use and building workflows around it. And this one is just about the fact that you know EDR took no configuration changes. So when they were testing it, it caught everything out the gate with default settings. Nothing had to be gone back and tweaked or reviewed or modified in order for EDR to maintain its high rating of being able to detect what it was able to detect compared to everybody else. So this is just a show of force for how powerful EDR is in its default state without you having to make any modifications to it. And that's going to come into play here in a minute whenever we start going over, well, what should you be choosing for your configuration settings? So productivity and operational gains. So what are you going to gain out of making the transition from traditional solutions to an EDR solution? Uh, First, we'll just you know, work through real quickly, AV response. What is your incident response for a situation where an AV catches a piece of malware or a virus? Um, we're just gonna start out at time zero. A threat event is detected, your AV catches it. Let's say you're using AV Defender inside of InCentral. You're gonna get the notification inside of InCentral that, you know, hey, it caught something. That alert is going to come back in in about you know 15 minutes or so based on what your um, agent frequency is. But on the intelligence gathering side, well, the only information that AV Defender is going to feed back to you is the time, the drive location, a generic descriptor name for whatever virus was found, and the action that was taken, blocked, quarantined, detected, whatever it may be you don't have any real good information to act on as a technician, a first responder on that information. You're gonna to have to go to the endpoint and begin doing an investigation. But if all you had was standard AV, there's not probably gonna be a lot of useful information there for you to find. You're gonna to have to dig, you're gonna to have to dig through logs, you're gonna to have to do correlation, you're probably gonna to have to use a tool like a chainsaw or something else to try and piece together what happened to that system. And because you don't have good awareness of what really happened to the system, when it comes time to remediate any damage that was done to the system by that threat, you kind of are in a, I have no clue what really happened. Therefore, I have to spray and pray. I've got to run a repair tool, a cleanup utility, a system restore, another scan with the AV, another scan with another AV vendor software. And this can be a not insignificant amount of time that a technician, help desk, or first responder spends on trying to sort this out. And then eventually they'll finish, everything's taken care of, they can uh, take their notes, close the ticket. It can be anywhere from 50, uh, 30 minutes to three hours later that they've spent on dealing with this. A good real world example of this, and this is just because oh, I came from the MSP space myself and I've been through it. AV catches something, you get the notification inside of InCentral, okay, great, it says it was taken care of. 
but then there's a help desk ticket that comes in from that user that says help my desktop background has turned black and I can't change it back to my kids football photo well, uh, team photo well client's going to expect you to fix that and the technician is going to go try and fix that and if they see that the AV caught something, well, okay, yeah, I can kind of put two and two together and figure out that, you know, the virus or whatever happened may have caused this, but they still don't know really why it happened, what changed on the system. So that's why you have to just throw stuff at it until you fix it most of the time versus with EDR, you have the threat event detected at zero time. And then if you have automatic remediation set up, Remediation is already done in less than a minute. Everything's already fixed and taken care of. By the time the user clicked on whatever malicious payload or file they clicked on, EDR caught it and reverted whatever changes were made to the system. From the end user's point of view, it's gonna seem like nothing happened at all or their background just changed black and back normal again for a few seconds. And then they'll get the pop-up notification in the bottom right for you know, EDR caught something. And if you were going to configure EDR just to be a better AV, because, well, I know I need something better than just standard virus, uh, standard definition-based AVs, but I do not want to spend more time managing it, you don't have to. You can set everything to default settings inside of EDR, get this type of behavior and walk away and not put any extra effort into it. But, you know, there's more that you can do with it. You're going to have the ability to, one, well, the remediation is going to be done really quickly. The event is going to be reported back in the EDR dashboard, which is going to give you more information than what you would have had otherwise. You will know the processes that were involved. You will be able to know what other machines in the environment were affected by the same threat. Were their IP connections made? Were they made internally within the network or were they made externally out to a C2 server? That's all going to be information that's available because of EDR in the dashboard. So the intelligence gathering for the technician is not going to the endpoint and interrupting an end user's productivity. It's going to the dashboard, looking at the information and using that information to decide what the further remediation or mitigation efforts might be warranted. And since EDR has that automatic remediation feature in it, which you know, is automatic, you do not have to be involved with it. It will revert those configuration settings, uh, registry changes that will revert those for you. The response can be called complete just because a technician acknowledges it. And then, well, your choice, do they just acknowledge it, write a quick note in the ticketing system and it's done, or do they pre prepare or do they prepare an incident report that is sent to the client because that's part of the services that you're selling. That's kind of the flexibility of EDR. And we're going to get into some, you know, some models of workflows and services you can build around it a little bit later. But this is the thing that I kind of want to take everybody to take home with you is realizing that EDR can be a significant change to what your workflows are. Because this can all happen within less than an hour. And whenever you, you know, at scale and you're applying it in your environment, you should be seeing some improvements. You should be seeing a reduction in number of help desk tickets for user experience issues because they clicked on something wrong. They grabbed a, a you know, a, a browser-based add-on, a piece of malware that's trying to change proxy settings, anything like that. It should be taking care of a lot of those types of incidents and reducing the occurrence. Uh, you'll be gaining more confidence in knowing that a threat incident has actually been resolved. If all you've got to go on is that your AV said it blocked something, you don't know what happened during that event. And there's no way for you really to know unless you had another solution like a SIM, SOAR, Huntress, whatever other type of solution you can possibly get your hands on. But that would be augmenting with another solution, which you could already have through EDR. You'll also be uh, less time spent by technicians on cleanup and remediation tasks because it's automated. Should be less time spent on intelligence gathering because it's right there in the dashboard. You don't have to go hunting for it. Um, you're also going to be less likely to see secondary payloads, which are usually more dangerous delivered by droppers. So an example of that is if somebody 
gets an email with a booby-trapped uh, Word document and they enable macros. So that macro is going to call PowerShell with some ossicated code to go download a secondary payload, a actual piece of malware or virus or something like TrickBot. Well, that's going to be more likely to be caught with an EDR solution like EDR than it will with legacy AVs. And hopefully this is also going to lead to less stress for technicians and help desk because you don't have to make those educated guesses anymore the way you used to. You're able to say, no, I actually have the information, the data in front of me. We can make an intelligent decision based on what we have. So this is all around you know, one tool, multiple services. And this is going to be like the last, mm, last three slides here or four slides before we get into the actual EDR product itself and start uh, going through some configuration options and how you can you know, get the best out of it. So with EDR, you're going to buy a license from us. There's just a license. You buy that, all of the functionality inside of it is open and available for you to use if you would like. Here I've got kind of a good, better, best type model of how you can leverage EDR in your environment. First is you can go for just the simple way of using it. You're going to treat it just again, uh, you're going to treat it the same as a regular AV, you're just getting it because you know you need a good solution in place that can detect uh, threats. You don't want to spend more time managing it than regular AV. You probably even want to spend less time managing it. Great, you can use it that way. You'd be setting the policy to kill quarantine and remediate and just letting do its thing and respond to tickets as you normally would for end user incidents. You can go the improved route. Well, you're still kind of treating it the same as AV, but you're going to leverage some of the other features inside of EDR to help harden client environments like the network control, USB control, uh, Bluetooth control. So you can set, you know, uh, controls over how those are going to behave on the endpoints. You'd still be setting the policy to kill quarantine and remediate as an automatic action. And you would still be reducing your management time significantly compared to traditional AV. Now you could go the advanced route, and this is where you're gonna treat EDR more as an MDR because you're gonna be doing the management part yourself. Um, you're gonna still be doing the network USB and Bluetooth control. You're, you're gonna enable the network quarantine functionality that I'll talk about in depth a little bit later. So you can isolate endpoints during a threat event through a software defined measure instead of having to rely on uh, security appliances and managed switches to make that happen. Uh, the policy would be set, set to kill quarantine. The remediation wouldn't be an automatic step because your techs, you know, part of the service you're selling is technicians, responders, security analysts, whatever hat you're going to put on them, are going to investigate threat events as they occur and decide if additional remediation or mitigation efforts are warranted for that threat event. If they decide yes they are, well, they can just push a button inside of EDR and those automatic remediations kick in, but they can also leverage the information they discovered there to put additional mitigations in place in the environment. So if there were seat, if there were IP connections that were being made during that threat event, well, if it was a local IP address, though, they have something to follow up on. They're going to go investigate in the environment what's going on with that other device. Why is it communicating during a threat event to this endpoint? or if it's communicating to the outside of the network. So that would be a clear indicator that it's communicating with a C2, a command and control server for a piece of malware, ransomware, or something else out in the world. Well, you can go take that IP information, that IP range, block it on your perimeter firewalls for that client, as well as probably go out and add it to your rest of your clients' uh, firewalling so you can further harden their environments as well. Again, these three variations of how you can build services around uh, EDR is up to you. You can make that decision. Of the one on the left is the easiest, least amount of time to manage, but you're also missing out on opportunities to increase your margins. And of course, the further you go to the right, it is going to take a little bit more effort. It will take more tweaking to your workflows, but hopefully because you're saving the time that you're saving in other places because of EDR, it shouldn't mean that you're really having to find more hours in the day to do it. So hardening systems with EDR. These are the things that you can do with EDR that are outside of the normal, well, 
just its AV, anti-malware, anti-virus, anti-ransomware capabilities. Uh, you're able to use EDR for setting controls on Bluetooth devices. So some of the old Bluetooth protocols are rather unsecure. And depending on if you're, you know, sensitivity of the client's uh, environment, their data, if they have certain compliances they have to adhere to, uh, you may not be able to use Bluetooth devices with you know, using protocols lower than 3.1. Well, you can come in here and you can easily block that in mass without having to do any scripting, GPO work, or anything else. And the nice thing is, is since it's software defined, you, uh, the work from home transition doesn't impact this at all. It's still going to be able to give you that control over those devices. Of course, this is always one of those things. You're not just going to turn this on and not tell anybody. It needs to be part of the, you know, the understanding of the contract and the, the, the bill of sales that you're offering as part of your managed services contract. But the important thing is, is don't just turn it on because you're going to have clients out there that have equipment, have Bluetooth enabled mice, keyboards, uh, uh, headphones, audio devices that or probably they've probably been using for years and they're their favorite thing in the world, but they're using old, deprecated, vulnerable Bluetooth protocols. And if you turn this on, you're gonna get lots, and without warning, you're gonna get a lot of angry emails and phone calls. So if you decide you are gonna use this, put in the effort of, all right, check your assets, look at your asset inventory, make sure that you can have some kind of capability to find where those Bluetooth, susceptible Bluetooth devices are in your environment send out a list, warn everybody about it, give them a cutoff date, and then do it. Let's save you some headaches. Uh, you can do similar with USB devices. So you're able to set up rules for USB devices on class or serial ID and this is or vendor, and this is useful for medical clients, CPAs, accountants, lawyers, where information is not supposed to come in or leave the environment on an unapproved channel. You can set it up to block all USB mass storage devices, but then add a rule to allow USB storage devices based on a specific serial ID. So we're not gonna let anybody bring in any random USB flash or storage drive that they just happen to have or they pick up outside and plug it in and take information in out or bring information in. We're gonna stop that because well, it's not secure, but Here's a box of pre-approved encrypted USB drives that I'm offering you to use for these purposes. So that can help control the environments, make them more secure and make sure that you know, your data flows are being controlled as much as you can. Then also there is the network isolation. So the ability to disconnect an endpoint from the network It's leveraging the Windows firewall to do this. And I'll go in a little bit deeper into that uh, when I'm in the live demo. But this allows you to have software defined network isolation during a threat event to keep an endpoint from being a potential starting point for lateral movements within your environment. Um, it can, and that's a big thing you're able to do nowadays. If you can do it, that will have a big impact on the scale of things like a ransomware incident or a, um, an APT group attack where they're going to be leveraging tools like TrickBot, Eternal Blue, or something else to try to make those lateral movements inside of an environment. And there is an ability to create uh, exclusion rules for this as well that I'll show off so you can still maintain connection to that endpoint even whenever the network isolation kicks in. Excellent. All right. So now we're going to drop into the demo real quick of. EDR inside of in central. Give me just one minute. Gotta log in, get past my MFA. All right, so for EDR inside of in central. So for EDR, if this is your first time really looking at or being exposed to EDR, it lives here underneath the integration section within in central. And the integration management here. If you want to go ahead and start a trial of EDR, you're going to handle that here. You'll have to enable it at system level if you're doing self-hosted. And if you're doing self-hosted, you may also have to reach out to, you know, to your partner success manager, your sales contact to make sure that that provisioning happens correctly. But if you're on 
uh, our hosted, it should be more straightforward, just enable it and you go. And all of the controls over EDR is gonna exist down here underneath this EDR section. Like anything else inside of in Central, you have the capability of having a customized dashboard view for the service monitors for EDR. And that is going to be just a quick for anybody that has not set up custom dashboards or are not familiar with it. That's going to happen underneath the underneath dashboards, manage a dashboard. You're going to add one. And what you're going to be using is the EDR enabled devices for your filter. And for services, EDR status. And that'll help you quickly create a customized dashboard view so you can monitor what your condition of your EDR agents are out in the field. And this can then, of course, this can, <clears throat> these service monitors can follow your same notification workflows and everything else that you have set for anything else inside of InCentral. And what you'll be able to monitor for with these monitors are going to be your uh, the DBT engine, making sure it's enabled, the EDR kernel driver, so the main kernel level processes of EDR up and running, the infected status, so does the EDR agent report, report that there is an active threat on a system or not, is EDR installed and running, is the tamper protection enabled, does the system require a reboot for uh, updates or something else. These are all of the, if this is in a failed state, you need to go investigate it because it's an active incident that needs your attention. There are a lot of other things that will happen with EDR where it does not honestly need immediate response or immediate attention and they're not included in here because the assumption is that if EDR has killed and quarantined something and taking all of the actions you have prescribed for it through the policy, there's nothing else for the technician to have to immediately do. It's all been automated. It's just something you're going to follow up on at a later point in time. Back down to the integration section and underneath EDR, there's three items we have. We have dashboard, analyze, and profiles. The dashboard view is useful as just a metrics view. This is good for coming in here and kind of seeing what your current status across the board is for your so or client that you're focused on but i would not try to navigate or click around in here because it's not really meant for it if you try to start navigating and clicking around inside of this dashboard view you may find yourself somewhere we didn't intend you to get to and that might you know basically just break the inner the interface or the session for you at that moment so you might start seeing that you can't click on it things and for it to refresh so Fair warning, as it is right now, this dashboard view is great for viewing some metrics, but that's about it. The Analyze tab is where you will go and actually do most of your interaction with day-to-day -day with EDR, and I'm gonna come back to this after we go over the profiles, because we're just gonna go through the profiles really quickly, because this is where a lot of the questions arise out of EDR and why you should choose one setting over the other and getting the most out of it. So we're just going to pick on Daniel here with his policy. And if you're going to go for that simple deployment of EDR, the whole I know I need a better solution to just than just standard AV, but I do not want to spend a lot of time or effort managing it, then you only have to choose a couple of options in here if at all you could literally just leave it on the default settings and you would be perfectly fine but we're going to go through and talk through some of these options real quickly so we all understand them and you know why we should choose them so first off edr is able to be placed in detect only mode this is useful for testing in new environments you will never know with any type of confidence how a security uh, software is going to behave in, or how an environment is going to react to it until you install it in that environment. So when you're testing EDR out, it is a good idea to put it in detect only mode, install it on a few machines, see how it behaves. 
so that you can get information back about what you should be creating exclusions for. Then once you've got those exclusions created, you can switch it over to protect mode and it'll start taking actions to get things automatically for you. You can also do the same with suspicious threats. And well, there has to be a threshold between what is not a problem, what could be a problem, and what definitely is a problem. We're just giving the ability to choose, do you want to treat the could be a problem the same as definitely a problem. You will wind up with a more secure environment if you are protecting against suspicious threats. However, you will also likely have to create additional exclusions down the road for false positives. That said, I don't look at that as a bad thing. I look at it as the point of view of you've come into a client's environment, you're responsible for that client's environment, you've gotten EDR dialed in for how it currently exists, and if three or four months down the road somebody gets upset because EDR was blocking them from installing a piece of software, well, from my point of view, you were doing what you were supposed to do. A new foreign piece of software showed up out of nowhere in that client's environment and you stopped it from being installed. That is a good thing. That is not a bad thing. That's an opportunity to you know, go over with the client about you know, what proper change control is and why it's so important that you are aware of and are involved in changes in their environments. So don't think of it as, you know, don't think of a false positive in the sense of it being an annoyance for the end user and hurting productivity. It's an opportunity for you to put a, you know, to plant your flag on the security hill and say, I'm taking this serious. The different engines for EDR, I'll leave them all on by default. There's not any really good reasons why you should ever have to turn any one of these particular engines off, except for some very, very unique edge cases. Uh, the first three engines are the pre-execution engines, closest thing to traditional AV behavior that the product has. The behavioral AI engine is the one that is leveraging the fact that EDR is a kernel level product that's doing driver injections on all processes. So it has full awareness of everything that's happening on a system in real time. All of that information is being fed through this engine to make decisions based on what the current, based on what is currently happening to the system you know, if those are good things or if those are bad things, have they crossed the threshold of its AI derived threat model into this is a bad thing and I should stop it. And it is that is the change in approach that a lot of modern solutions have been making. They're getting away from the old way of, I have a giant list of known bad files and if I see the bad file, I'll block the bad file. Or, I'm going to look inside of a file and if I see a red flag because you know it's got a you know, high, it's got a high entropy in a library that was used to build it or there's Cyrillic letters in the manifest for the executable or it has a known malicious binary inside of it we're going to block it before it runs this is looking at what happens to the system in real time and deciding if it's doing a bad thing so it's that switch from basically predictive best guess, I think this will do something bad to, no, I'm looking at it, I'm seeing what it's doing, and I know it's doing something bad there, I'm going to stop it. And that's why EDR and other solutions that are close to it have such higher efficacy rates than others. And we kind of saw that with those earlier slides. A documents and scripts, PDS, Word documents, spreadsheets, embedded macros, things of that nature, lateral movement as we're dealing with, you know, lateral movement within the network attacks that are coming from uh, things like eternal blue exploitation, wanna cry, not pet ya, or, uh, and those types of wormable attacks. Uh, Anti-exploitation and fileless, browser-based attacks, secondary malware payloads, um, obfuscated PowerShell code those that are lo that's loading things directly into memory, uh, those who are gonna be what this engine is dealing with. Uh, potential analytic applications, this is for Macs, not our concern right now in the integrated version, since the integrated version is not supporting Macs. Same with the application control, this is for containerized Linux environments. And then the detect interactive threat, this is for, um, this is for interactive threats. This is for somebody that has access to a computer and is leveraging command prompt, PowerShell, VBS scripts, batch files, or something else to try and you know, a living off the land attack of using whatever is already there on the system to 
do reconnaissance, to do damage, whatever their next steps are going to be as part of an attack. This particular engine here is a significant piece of system hardening you're putting in place that you will never get with standard AV. And the best way of describing what the impact of this particular engine is, is let's say we've got an RDP exposed out to the world. You didn't know about it. It's from legacy infrastructure, whatever, but there's an exposed RDP port and somebody brute forces it. Um, they use a vulnerability against it. They you know, buy a set of compromised credentials offline on the dark web for seven bucks. Whatever happens, an attacker finds that RDP port, gets in on it, and they're now an administrator on whatever's behind that RDP and they can do whatever they want. Um, if they if you have EDR in place, then they should not be able to just drop a piece of a ransomware because of all of these engines stopping from that. They should not be able to defeat EDR's protection by turning it off or snoozing it or uninstalling it because of the anti-tamper feature, which you know, should always be on. And they're not going to be able to perform living off the land attacks by leveraging you know, a pre-prepared attack script or batch file or PowerShell because of this particular engine here interrupting that process. And all of this is to put multiple barriers in place to prevent attackers from doing what they want to do, cause havoc, cause damage to your environments. Hopefully that by the time they get through all of this, they will honestly have thrown up their hands and gone away because the systems are too hardened for their attack, for their tactics and measures. Once EDR finds something and it says, hey, I have now classified you as an attack, you know, as a bad thing, then there's the kill, quarantine, remediate, and rollback actions. Um, these are going to be the default automatic actions. Killing quarantine is perfectly fine and acceptable option here to use, but you're missing out on the remediation being an automatic action for you. Workstations. Um, Servers that are doing simple tasks like file share or of that nature. Uh, end users where all they're really doing is using web portals and there's no you know, highly customized uh, line of business software in the environment. Leaving the remediation as an automatic option is not a bad option to go with. The rollback might be something that you hold in reserve as, you know what, we'll use the rollback whenever we know there's an incident that requires the use of the rollback. But technical wise, there's no good reasons why you wouldn't use automatic rollback on all workstations and even on a lot of servers. But there is plenty of business reasons why you might not. And there's some opportunities there. So again, if you were using EDR as just a better AV and you want to spend as little time messing with it as possible, then you know, throw it on full rollback as an automatic option. If you're selling it as a more advanced solution, as an MDR, or you're building some other type of security offering around it, you may leave the kill and quarantine as the default automatic action, and then it's on your responders and your technicians to come in, evaluate a threat incident, and decide if they need to push the remediate button and make it happen, or you know, use that information to go do other things. So whatever you choose here, it's just going to be the automatic response. It's not an on-off button for the feature. Uh, for this rollback as well, if you decide that this rollback is going to be a very important part of EDR and you want to make sure, uh, and you're selling and marketing on it, well, you're going to want to make sure that it works, that it's viable. And in order to make sure that it, and to help ensure that it's going to work and be viable when you need it, you need to monitor the status of your VSS snapshots on the system. Uh, we have in the, and I'm gonna go just navigate here real quick. Um, if you have not seen the automation cookbook, this is a resource of pre-made um, service monitors and automations that you can use inside of InCentral. And one of them that we have in here is monitoring the status of the VSS snapshots on a system. So this will be a service monitor that will let you know if the last snapshot available on the system for EDR is older than 
whatever you set the threshold for 24 hours 48 hours whatever you want it to be because if there's not vss snapshots being done on the system then that means your rollback functionality is compromised and you need to go investigate correct it so you can make sure that whenever you need that rollback it will be available The disconnect from network option here, this is just a single button to enable it or disable it. If you are going to use it, make sure you communicate the implications of this to all stakeholders because this is one of those things of you are actively going to say, during a threat incident that is detected automatically, we're going to lock down that machine and keep it from communicating with anything else on the local network or anything on the WAN. So that machine is going to be isolated and it's not going to be use, useful for anything. The person using it is going to be completely out. Uh, productivity is going to go to zero. So you have to have an understanding that that is acceptable. Now, what actually triggers this is in the event that EDR, uh, as soon as EDR detects something on the system, it classifies it as an active threat and it will only move it out of the active threat category once it has successfully killed and quarantined whatever it was if it fails that the endpoint is going to stay in an active threat mode and in which case it's going to continue to stay isolated in the environment that is desirable that is good it gives you your 10 15 20 minutes you need to go look, investigate, see why this was triggered, what the threat incident was, so you can make the next decision on, I understand what this is and it's safe for this machine to be reconnected to the network or no, this looks like an actual attack. We're gonna leave that machine isolated and we're gonna roll a truck to pick it up, do forensics, whatever your next step is gonna be. You just have to treat this option with a, health, with a healthy dose of respect because if you turn this on unannounced to a client, it will cause tension. So you might as well have it as part of the conversation, get buy-in, make margin on it. And if you are going to use this one, well, then there's also underneath the network control, and this is an important thing, uh, you have the ability to, well, first under network control, this gives you the ability to add firewall rules to your endpoints. So this does not replace the Windows firewall. It simply gives you a location for you to control the Windows firewall rules from a centralized location. So here in just a few seconds, I've added a rule for any machines using this policy to block the RDP protocol across the board. Uh, this is very useful because even if, you know, if you're using in central, you're probably using take control. Uh, you might be using some other solutions. There's not a lot of us that are going to be using um, RDP on all systems all the time. It's usually only select systems that we're using it with. By blocking it across the board, I'm reducing attack services because yes, our firewall appliance on the edge may be blocking RDP uh, protocol or calls, but if an internal device is compromised and there's nothing protecting the other machines, from it, then well, it's still a valid attack path for an attacker to use. But in regards to the network quarantine, you have the ability to come in here and add rules. So whenever that network quarantine does fire off, you're able to have an allow rule for certain connections still. So you could come in here and add rules for specific IP addresses. So whether that's a internal resource that you wanna be able to uh, uh, have a jump box for, so you can log into the environment and then go touch that machine from uh, an RDP port from an internal source, you can do that. Or if you wanted to go through the trouble and we do not have this documented because there's not a good universal way of documenting this for everybody because it's going to be different for everybody based on your in central server where it is hosted and everything else um, you could add the information for your in central server infrastructure and your take control infrastructure so you could still continue to use those um, unfortunately that is just a there is no choice for you there but to roll up your sleeves use the documentation we have for what our ip connections are 
uh, know and understand and find out what your IP connections are for your in central infrastructure and add it and test it and verify that it works. Then there is also the device control. So we mentioned this as part of the hardening efforts that you can add into in central. Um, this gives me really quickly, we'll say we'll add a rule for for old Bluetooth versions. So I can say block Bluetooth based on the classification of version, block, anything older than you know three, done. Um, again, this is one of those things of you know Bluetooth devices that are older are unsecure. They broadcast a lot of information in very easily interceptable and decipherable ways. So if you're in a environment where air gapping is a thing or an environment where security is being taken very seriously then bluetooth devices probably lower than version 4.1 probably really shouldn't be allowed in environments you can also do it based on hardware identifiers so i could come here and say we're going to block bluetooth devices based on the class of all right so we're going to let everybody use audio and video bluetooth so they can keep using their audio headsets but we're going to block Bluetooth on, you know, human interface devices. So no Bluetooth keyboards, mices, uh, or Bluetooth uh, cameras or anything of that nature, or even wearables or toys. There, there's all kinds of ways in here you can block additional stuff based on classification. Then we can do another rule for, say, uh, the USB. So we can do USB based on a class, and then we will block the class of mass storage. So if I applied this with nothing else in play, then any machine that had this policy enabled, you could go to that computer, plug in a USB flash drive, and it will not mount. You will not be able to read it. And, there will, and you will be hard pressed to find a way to work around that on the endpoint. It's uh, one of those things of, technically feasible possibly, but impossible for laymen and impossible even for probably most of us that are here today. And then I can go back and create another rule after I have one to block all, I can have one that allows based on serial ID. So again, everything's blocked on mass storage devices except for you know the handful of encrypted USB keys that are going to be sold to and monitored for the client to make sure that the uh make sure that the uh, disk encryption stays in play and that somebody doesn't remove it you would have to do that of course with service monitors through in central but it's part of that larger security service you could be offering then there's into the analyze section so this is the you know everything we went over is the getting it set up in the first place, asking those questions about, you know, what do we want to use this as? How do we want to optimize this for uh, our, uh, for, you know, the, the service model we're going to build around it. But then there's just the day to day part of EDR, which is as a technician, I'm going to be monitoring my EDR dashboard, or I'm going to be getting notifications from our PSA and ticketing. And whenever something happens and I get that alert, okay, so this machine needs a uh, needs a reboot. I can go reboot the system. Or if it says that there's an, the infected status is that it's infected, then I can go down to the analyze tab and see what those infections are. What were those threat events? And I can do it from a top level or I can do it from a deep dive. Again, if I'm going for simplicity and I don't want to spend a lot of time on this and I'm just treating it again as a better AV, then I can just say, all right, well, I don't recognize any of these things. It's not any piece of software I use. It's not a piece of software the client uses and nobody's calling to complain that their software is not working. So it's just fine that EDR blocked, whatever this is. I can just quickly come in here and say, all right, cool. Then that has been properly resolved by the system it's already taken care of or if i see something that i do recognize is, oh no i know what that is that's my tool that's the client's tool we're going to allow that to run i can come in here select it and then just choose add to exclusions 
and it's just three clicks, it's added to exclusions and it's done. That exclusion is applied to the policy and I don't have to worry about it anymore. If I need to dive in deeper to these events though, then it's just a click away. I can click on a single event, That'll start giving me tons of information that I can use to make my next step decisions based on. I will be able to see what has been killed, what has been quarantined, what has been remediated and rolled back. I'll be able to export that information out as a CSV. So anybody that's been doing IT support at any time long enough knows that something happens to a computer, you fix it somehow by system restore, or by throwing an AV scan at it and it finds something and it uh, pulls out whatever that was, there's going to be the, well, what happened question. And a lot of times you cannot answer that what happened question, really. You have to reduce it down to generalized statements about what happened. Part of that is you're reducing it down to generalized statements so that the non-technical person understands what you're talking about. But it's also because, well, sometimes you really just don't know. EDR gets rid of that, you just don't know. You're actually going to know what happened to that system. Every process that was launched, every configuration change that was made, and every and you'll be able to double check and confidently say that those changes were remediated. There's also the uh, the rest of the information that's going to be available, such as you know the time it occurred, when it was reported, how many machines it was. So this can quickly let you see is it widespread or individual machine the uh, time, uh, the location of it, the process, uh, cert IDs, uh, if the originating process, so what launched it, you would be able to see that it was a download that was auto launched by Chrome, if that was what happened. And then you'll have the hash value down here, where um, if you have a, um, if you have a login for recorded future, you can go use recorded future, or you can just use open uh, virus total. And this allows you to go leverage the wisdom of the community. It will take the hash for whatever that payload file is, if there is a payload file. It will take that hash, search for it, and show you, well, this is what other vendors are detecting. And you'll see that you know, this one's kind of a mix. You have uh, uh, some names in here that are going to be recognizable, like Fortinet, FireEye, Kaspersky, McAfee, Semantic, uh, WebRoot. But then you're going to have other ones down here that aren't picking it up, like CrowdStrike, Falcon doesn't pick it up, Avira, Komodo, F-Secure. And so this kind of lets you know quickly the lay of the land that, you know, again, reinforcing that efficacy thing. But also you have the ability to check out behaviors, relations, so you can see what's being connected to, what's being communicated to. This is where you using EDR as an MDR and leveraging the additional intelligence to further remediate and add mitigations to the environment to protect against this attack. Being able to come in and say, I know these are the IP addresses that are being connected to, let's go block those. We know these are the files that are being dropped. Let's go write a service monitor uh, for in central that goes and looks for those files that are being dropped. So even if we have clients that are not paying us for EDR, we can go look and see if those exist in their environments. And if they do, we have a starting point to have a conversation with them about, look, the only way we found out about this is because of EDR at another client's environment. If we did not have that knowledge, we would have never have caught this in your environment. This is why we need to have this type of solution in place. And then the explore and the timeline, this gives you the process waterfall if it's available because there were changes that were made to the system. All of those changes will be listed on the bottom and that's more information that you can leverage. And then the timeline is the easy human readable thing. This is if you're selling this as a more robust service and part of that service is you're going to write an incident report for threat events then this is your bullet points for what happened. So it happened at this time, it was detected. It was, uh, uh, it was confirmed with high confidence by the AI derived threat model you're running EDR with that, hey, this is probably a bad thing. It was killed in quarantine at this time. And then we eventually came in and a technician reviewed it at this time, seven minutes later. They came in, reviewed everything, uh, 
performed additional remediations or decided that the remediations that were automatically applied were adequate. And this can be a two sentence canned response, or this can be a half page um, incident or a two page incident report. It's all up to you. What service do you build around it? Because whenever you start pushing it to that level, whenever you start building around this a security offering where you're leveraging all of this functionality and putting it into play, this is how the this is how MSPs get to the point where they are charging 40, 50, a hundred dollars per endpoint to manage things because they're doing all these things and they have all their other automations and services that are bundled into it. This is how you start getting up to those prices. A uh, question came in, when's the next major GUI release? So the update for the integration in here, uh, it will probably not be until after the next major Sentinel-1 version update that we do. There is, uh, we don't have a delivery date on it, but we're adding in deep visibility as a feature for EDR. And whenever that's added in, that's going to be the next major GUI update. Uh, but that's not a, we don't have a hard delivery date for that at this time. Um, about the best guess I can give you there is it's not going to be before the end of the year, most likely.